OK, so this week we will be discussing the Hebrew Bible. Then I will introduce the Christian Bible for next week. And next week after discussing the Christian Bible, I will introduce the final exam. So you won't want to miss that. Um, after class next week, you will have one week to finish the final exam. And for week 18, it, since it won't be on the exam and it's an extra week anyways, I thought that uh, I could use Chinese to teach that week. How does that sound? Right, so just to confirm that everyone can in fact understand Chinese. Uh, if you cannot understand Chinese, please tell me. OK, let's begin today. Um, so we're reading from Genesis, Chuang and Exodus, Chu Ai Ji Ji. One, footnote two gives the two most common names for God in the Torah, and the Torah is the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Did you know that God has a name? Why do you think it is rarely used? Two, why do you think God asks Adam and Eve, where are you? And Cain, where is Abel, your brother? This question is because uh, God is supposed to know everything. So why is he asking? Three, does the reason humans build the Tower of Babel make sense? Why or why not? And does the reason God scatters the humans make sense? Why or why not? Four, when Lot tries to warn his sons-in-law, he seemed to them to be joking. Are there other moments in this week's reading when it might seem like the word of God is a joke? If so, why would they seem like a joke? And five, what might the order of the Ten Commandments tell us about God's priorities? Let's start with one, the name of God. So this is on foot, uh, page 39, footnote two. Footnote two is here. When God, footnote two. This word God translates the word Elohim, uh, the Hebrew word, which is one of the most common names for God in the Torah. The other common name is this word, which is probably pronounced Yahweh. It is used, for example, in the story of Adam and Eve in chapter two of Genesis, which we will get to later. Uh, and in this translation, it is translated at using the word Lord. So when you see the word God, it is Elohim. When you see the word Lord, it is Yahweh. So the question is, God has a name? This is interesting. Usually we just say God, right? There are many gods, but only one God that begins with the capital G. And if you think about it, it does make sense for God to have a name. Uh, we mentioned last week that um, in much of Jewish history, there were in fact many gods, but only one God was acceptable for the Jews. So you'd have to have a way to differentiate between the different gods. Right? If you just say God, like when you're talking to somebody and you just say God, how do you know uh, which God you're talking about? When you write it down, of course, you can use a capital G. But when you're talking, you need a way to differentiate. Um, so the name of that God is either Elohim or Yahweh, depending on the tradition that you are using. A lot of religion 
is like this. They uh, incorporate and absorb and include many elements from other religions. For example, in Christianity, Easter was taken from an older religion and the original meaning of Easter was not the day when Jesus rose from the dead, but simply the coming of spring. It was a spring festival. Uh, but Christianity borrowed that festival and, and gave it a new meaning. There are many reasons uh, why religions do this. One is that for a new religion, it's already hard enough to get people to believe in this new thing. If you reuse some elements from these people's earlier religion, it can make it easier to get them to believe in your new religion. Another reason is that often new religions, for similar reasons, uh, portray themselves as very similar to or a continuation of those older religions. It's also to help people to believe in the new religion. So some of those older elements will be left over and reused. So these are a couple of reasons why uh, God may have a name. Now, another interesting part is notice this second name. There are no vowels. So how do you say this word? Nobody really knows, but scholars guess that it's probably pronounced Yahweh. And this is the more commonly known name of God. If you need to name the name of God, uh, usually people will say that his name is Yahweh. Now, why don't we know exactly how to say this name? Uh, again, a few reasons. One is that Hebrew does not actually have vowels. It's like Arabic. Instead of vowels, you would put a mark in the place where you should add a vowel sound. Now, what sound should you add? It depends on the mark, and it also depends on the knowledge of the word in daily life. So it's kind of like uh, in Chinese, we don't have consonants in vowels written in the language. So how do you know how to pronounce each character? because you learn the word in daily life. It's the same principle. So. If sometime during history. People have forgotten how to say this word, then we only have the written form left and we don't know where to add the vowels and we don't know how to add the vowels, which vowels to add. So we could only guess. Now, why you think like this is the name of God? This is a pretty important name. How would we lose knowledge of how to say his name? Well, just like how perhaps many of you didn't know that God has a name. When this God becomes the one and only God that is acceptable, people don't need to say his name. They can just say God and people will know which God you're talking about. So over time, even though people know that he has a name, maybe they have forgotten how to say the name because nobody needed to say it. Now, some people think that uh, there might have been a taboo, jing ji, on saying his name. It's like how you don't usually call your parents by their name, right? You say mom and dad, father, mother, you don't call them by their names. So something similar may also have happened with the name of God. But this is less sure. This reason is more guessing. Uh, we're not quite sure if this reason is true. 
So that's the name of God, um, especially in the West today when religion has become less and less popular. Sometimes instead of saying God with a capital G, you will see people say Yahweh to refer to the Christian God or to refer to the Jewish God as a sign that this is not the God that I believe in. So I use his name. I don't call him my God. OK, questions for number one. Uh, OK, one second. Let me deal with something. OK, question two. Why does God ask these questions? First one, page 41. This is the famous story of how Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit. Um, and let's start here. The serpent is the snake. Said to the woman, you shall not be doomed to die if you eat the forbidden fruit. Because this is what God said, right? If you eat the forbidden fruit, you will die. And the, certain, uh, the serpent says no. For God knows that on the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will become as gods, knowing good and evil. So the serpent's idea is God only says you're going to die to keep you from eating it because he knows that if you eat it, you will become as gods, knowing good and evil. So it's like God wants to protect his own power. Uh, Eve believes the serpent and the woman saw that the tree was good for eating and that it was lust to the eyes, and the tree was lovely to look at. That's what that means. Lust to the eyes just means that it was lovely to look at. And she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her man, and he ate. And the eyes of the two were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves, and made themselves loincloths. A fig is a kind of fruit. Someone called Wu Hua Guo. Uh, not exactly sure why it's fig leaves, but this is the tradition. And using these leaves, they sewed them together, ma feng qi and made loincloths. Loin is uh, 用中文讲就是属西部. So a loincloth is a cloth that covers your private parts. So only after they ate this fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, did they suddenly realize that they were naked. So like, of course they had always been naked, but the idea of being naked did not used to always mean shameful. In the Christian tradition and the Jewish tradition, um, sex is only sinful because eating this forbidden fruit opened up Adam and Eve's eyes to the idea of lust or desire. So apparently before eating the fruit, sex was just like talking or chatting or playing or walking or running, just another activity. But after eating the fruit, they gained the knowledge that somehow this was shameful. And so if sex is shameful, then being naked is also shameful. And so that's the starting point of humans wearing clothes. According to the Bible. OK, 
here's the related part to the question. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking about in the garden in the evening breeze, and the human and his woman hid from the Lord God in the midst of the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to the human and said to him, Where are you? And he, Adam, said, I heard your sound in the garden, and I was afraid, for I was naked and I hid. So because he was naked, he was afraid of God. This, of course, did not used to be the case. This had never happened before. So God said, who told you that you were naked? From the tree I commanded you not to eat. Have you eaten? So, you know, by this point, God knows what happened. So. Why does he ask? Adam and Eve this question. Well, look at what happened, right? He asked the question. Adam answered in a way that betrayed his betrayal. It revealed his betrayal. His disobedience. And so God confirmed and Adam said, yes, Eve gave it to me and I ate. Then God asks Eve and Eve said, the serpent gave it to me and I ate. So God knows what happened. It seems like he only asks these questions in order for Adam and Eve to recognize that they have done something wrong. It's kind of making them face their mistake, to admit and face their mistake. Let's see if this is true also for the second half of the question, Cain and Abel. So this story starts near the end of page 42. Cain and Abel are the sons of Adam and Eve. Uh, Cain is the older and Abel is the younger. Here. Uh, Cain brought from the fruit of the soil, he's a farmer, an offering to the Lord. So it's a sacrifice. And Abel too had brought from the fir choice firstlings of his flock. So Abel is a shepherd. And the Lord regarded Abel and his offering, but he did not regard Cain and his offering. So here the word regard, it goes back to its original definition, which means look at. So God only looked at Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's sacrifice. This is strange because Cain is the older brother, and yet God favors the younger brother. And Cain was very incensed. Which means he was pissed, he was very angry. So what happens? Cain said to Abel, his brother, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Bum, bum, bum. This is the, according to the Bible, this is the first murder in human history. So after Cain kills Abel, the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And Cain says, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Was that a Baoguanyu in Ma? This is famous. To be your brother's keeper is something that we still say today, which means that we each have a responsibility to help and take care of other people. In this story, they are actual brothers. But since according to the Bible, we are all descended from this family, so. We are all technically brothers and sisters to each other. So today when we say that you should be your brother's keeper, it means that you should help. And take care of your fellow human beings. You should care about other people. 
So compare this exchange with when God asked Adam and Eve. He asked Adam and Eve what happened and they told God the truth. But here when he asks Cain what happened to Abel, Cain says, I don't know. Why ask me? He lies to God. And God said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the soil. I think that Abel, that is, the blood that was thrown into the ground. And so, cursed shall you be by the soil that gaped with its mouth to take your brother's blood from your hand. Gape means open. So, since the soil had opened up and taken Abel's blood, so the soil will curse Cain. And the curse is that Cain is a farmer, but the soil will no longer give you its strength. You will no longer be able to grow things. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. So again, here God seems to give Cain a chance to admit his mistake. But Cain lies, he denies it. So God has to bring up some kind of evidence to curse him. And the evidence is what he hears from the soil. Notice how the two situations are different. Adam and Eve have just eaten the forbidden fruit. They perhaps have not yet gotten used to the idea of being able to sin, to make mistakes and do wrong things. But Cain is from the next generation and uh, the selection in our textbook doesn't tell you, but Adam lived to be 1000 years old. So when it says next generation, it's not 30 years. It's like 900, 800 years. So over time, Cain has. Uh, we can say he has explored more of the freedom to sin. So he now realizes that he doesn't have to tell the truth. So when we talk about original sin, the idea that sin can be passed down from one generation to the next, 就是人罪, this is one of the reasons why. Because the more time you dwell in sin, the more time that you spend with the idea of original sin, the more freedom you may discover to do things wrong, to do wrong things. So by doing the same thing twice, by asking humans, what have you done? What's going on? God also shows us how original sin works. He shows us that the more we are in sin, the more likely we are to continue in sin. So do you have questions or ideas about number two? OK, let's move on to number three, the Tower of Babel. You know, every story in our textbook selection is important. Like these are all classic so-called Bible stories. Even people who have not actually read these stories. In the West, if you talk about these stories, they will know what you're talking about. So I highly encourage you, if you have not yet finished reading these selections, uh, to spend some time and to read them, to, uh, to get to know these stories. So for example, the story of the Tower of Babel 
as our textbook says, explains the origin of languages. So let's look at this story. And all the earth was one language, one set of words. And it happened as they, which means humanity, journeyed from the east, that they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to each other, Come, let us bake bricks and burn them hard. Yao Hong Kao Zhuanto. And the brick served them as stone, and bitumen, Li Qing, served them as mortar. Mortar is the thing that you spread on top of bricks to keep the bricks together. Uh, today we usually use cement, Shui uh, but that thing is called mortar. Let's see what it's called in Chinese. I should know this. Sa jiang. That doesn't seem right. But it's what you spread on bricks to keep them together when you build like a wall or something. Right, so they start building. And they said, come, let us build us a, a city and a tower with its top in the heavens that we may make us a name lest we be scattered over all the earth. So they want to build a city, and among that city, there will be a tower, Galta. And it will be so high that it reaches the heavens. Today in English, the heavens just means the sky. Now, why do humans want to do this? So that we may make us a name. We want to have a reputation. Lest, which means in case e fang we be scattered over all the earth so right now all of humanity is living in like very nearby right but they say they're thinking like one day if we spread over all the world um what if nobody knows who we are anymore so we should make a name for ourselves by building this tower that reaches the heavens Now, that kind of doesn't make sense, right? Because this is supposed to be all of humanity. So why do they need to make a name for themselves? Who are they worried would forget them? If they are all, if all of humanity is here and later all of humanity spreads throughout the world, they are still humans. They all know who each other is. So from this, we can kind of see that the Bible says it's about the creation of the world and humans. But underlying a lot of these stories is always the idea that. These are only one group of people. It seems like there are other groups of people somewhere else in the world. But for the Bible, the only group of people that really matters is the Jewish people, the people who believe in the God Yahweh. So here it says humanity. Um, but it, this only makes sense if there are actually other groups of humans nearby. So that's the reason that this group of humans wants to make the city and the tower to make a name for themselves to become famous. So the first part of question three, does that make sense to you? Uh, I guess I already answered this. It only makes sense if there are other groups of humans in order to register the fame, to recognize the fame. Let's continue the story. So the humans start building this thing. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the human creatures had built. Notice that here it says that they have already built this tower. 
in lots of modern interpretations of the story or modern retellings of the story, it's usually said that humans did not finish building the tower. But here it says that they have finished. And like the reason we usually think of humans as not having finished is. Like. They want to build a tower to reach the heavens. They want to reach God. And let's see how God reacts. And the Lord said, as one people with one language for all. People here means Mingzu, so they are one people. If this is what they have begun to do, nothing they plot will elude them. 简单来说就是, Come, let us go down and baffle their language. Let's mix up their language there so that they will not understand each other's language. And the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they left off building the city. So they didn't finish building the city. So it looks like here had built means the part that they had finished. Although it does not mention the tower, right? Maybe they finished the tower. So this is what God did. Therefore, it is called Babel, this place. For there the God made the language of all the earth Babel. Babel in English means Hu Yan Luan Yu. I mean, sorry, in Chinese it means Hu Yan Luan Yu. And from there the Lord scattered them over all the earth. So why does God like do this? Why does God come down and mix up the language and spread people over the earth? The reason he gives is if this is what they have begun to do, nothing they plot will elude them. Elude means escape. So if they can do this, anything they want to do, they will be able to do. Apparently this scares God. I guess it's kind of like the forbidden fruit. According to the logic of the serpent, if humans eat of the fruit and they gain knowledge of good and evil, they will be like God. Now, this is only the serpent's logic. We don't know whether God really thinks this, but here God specifically says that he wants to keep humans from doing some things. He wants to prevent them from being able to achieve everything. This might be a continuation of that same logic. So even if the original reason God did not want humans to eat the forbidden fruit is not what the serpent says, now that they have eaten the forbidden fruit, God does have to be careful about what humans can do. 就是也许可以这样说啦，就是吃了善恶知识之果之前，也许上帝没有这样想，可是既然人类吃了，上帝就要开始防范人类能达成什么样的事情。不要就是变成一种挑战或威胁。So this story also has a number of weird elements that we have to explain in order to make this story make sense. The first part we just talked about, God feels threatened by humans. But another part is notice what God says. He says, come, let us build us a city. Sorry, not humans. He said, come, let us go down. Us. God is one God. What is this us? So this kind of points to how maybe in the earlier years of the Jewish religion, God was not in fact one God. Maybe there were two gods or even three gods 
working together. Or maybe it's one God with different aspects. It's kind of like how in Hinduism, some gods have different aspects. Or even in uh, ancient Greece and Rome, we talked about how different gods will be worshipped in different ways in different cities. So instead of just Athena, you would have Palace Athena, Athena as they worshipped her in the place called Palace. Different aspects of the same God. So it looks like this God also had something similar going on. So next week, um, when we talk about Christianity, um, the selection will not say this, but in Christianity, they believe in something called the Holy Trinity, Sanwei which is kind of similar. This logic is kind of similar. The idea is that God is actually three parts. There is God himself. Then there is his son, Jesus. And then there is something called the Holy Spirit, Sun Sun. And th these three are all part of God. They are all God. Even though they are three, they are three of the same things. This doesn't sound like it makes sense. It sounds nonsense. Um, and for many, many, many years, Christian philosophers have tried to make sense of this logic. What does it mean for one God to have three aspects that are each itself, but also they are all God themselves? And when you put them together, they are also God. This could also be inherited from this part of the story, the very early idea that there is more than one aspect to this God. And then one final thing to notice is that humans say they want to build the city and the tower to prevent being scattered over all the earth and forgetting each other. But Precisely because they build the city and the tower, God scatters them and confuses their language so they don't remember and they can't communicate about this city and this tower. So this, in fact, is an example of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Just like how Oedipus only fulfills his curse when he tries to prevent the curse. Here, humans are only mixed up and scattered and forget each other only when they try to prevent this happening. So like even in the Hebrew and Jewish tradition, we also have self-fulfilling prophecies as well. It's not unique to Greece. Um, though speaking of which, the Bible, the the Hebrew Bible is usually considered younger than ancient Greek uh, literature, like Homer. Homer is usually considered older. Okay, do you have questions about three? OK, let's look at four. The story of Lot and uh, his family and the city of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, if you watch the Marvel movie Guardians of the Galaxy, one of the characters names is Gomorrah. This is the source of that name. So this story starts on page 49. Um, I'll give you the short version. You can read the longer version. Actually, no, we have time. Let's do the whole thing. Two messengers came into Sodom at evening when Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And Lot saw 
and he rose to greet them and bowed with his face to the ground. And he said, Oh, please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house to spend the night and bathe your feet and you can set off early on your way. So like he's very polite to these strangers. Uh, and this is because in the Middle East, just like in ancient Greece, it was incredibly important to be polite to guests. Right, so he calls them my lords. What a jewel. He calls himself your servant, Nidapuran. And he offers his home and to clean their feet uh, to these two strangers. He doesn't know these two. And they said, no, we will spend the night in the square. And he, Lot, pressed them hard. He insisted. And they turned aside to him and came into his house and he prepared them a feast, Sun Yin, and baked flat bread and they ate. They had not yet lain down, when the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house from lads to elders, every last man of them. So lad here just means young man. Every man surrounded the house. And they called out to Lot and said, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. And Lot went out to them at the entrance, closing the door behind him. And he said, please, my brothers, do no harm. Look, I have two daughters who have known no man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you want. Only to these men do nothing, for have they not come under the shadow of my roof beam? OK, so here he's saying. Don't mistreat my guests. You can mistreat my daughters, but you cannot mistreat my guests. This is how powerful the rule about guests was he would offer up his own daughters instead of his guests. Another reason is because of the word no. The word no in the Bible means something very different. Let me show you an example. Um, let's see. Actually, from well, uh, the story of Cain and Abel. Here. And the human knew Eve, his woman, and she conceived and bore Cain. So Adam knew Eve, therefore Eve became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. So we know that in the Bible, the word no means to have sex with. Another way to say this is to lie with. So here, um, when when the men of Sodom say, bring out the men to us so that we may know them, it means let us have sex with them. In other words, let us rape them. Sodom, this is like one of the reasons why Sodom is considered one of the most evil cities in the Bible. Like they would just go out and rape random men. Men that were in fact were guests in someone's house. And so even today the word Sodom is the source of the word sodomy, which means uh, to have sex anally, Jin doesn't have to be between men. Um, but that's this is the source of that word. Actually, I wonder if Microsoft Teams lets me say that word.
Ah, it doesn't let me say the word. OK, so. Microsoft really likes to censor. The word is. Sodomy. Uh, I wrote it down for you in the chat. Right, so this is another reason why Lot is willing to offer his daughters instead of his guests. The, the men of Sodom are so evil. Um, something terrible will happen to whomever Lot offers. So it's better to offer someone that he has control over rather than someone who is protected as a guest. Uh, and just like in ancient Greece, the the rule to protect guests is not just a rule among people. It is backed up by religion. In ancient Greece, the gods command you to protect your guests and take care of your guests. In the Bible, God himself, Yahweh, uh, orders you to protect your guests. It is something holy. Sensenda. Um, so that's what Lot does. He protects his guests at all cost. But the men of Sodom say, step aside. And they said, this person came as a sojourner, so as a traveler. And he sets himself up to judge. So now they're talking about Lot. Lot did not originally belong to this city. He came later. And yet he can decide uh, who we can have sex with and who we cannot. Like, how dare he, right? Now we'll do more harm to you than to them. And they pressed hard against the man lot and moved forward to break down the door. And the men, here the two messengers, his guests, reached out their hands and drew Lot to them into the house and closed the door. And the men at the entrance of the house, they struck with blinding light from the smallest to the biggest, and the, the men outdoors could not find the entrance. So these two messengers are messengers from God, so they have holy power. So they, they use blinding light to confuse everybody outside. Uh, it's kind of like MIB, Men in Black, right? Xing Di Zanjing. Something like that. And the two guests said to Lot, Whom do you still have here? Your sons and your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Outcry. So it's such an evil place that the victims of this place have called out to God, and God has agreed to destroy this place. And Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law. So his daughters are married. He offered up his married daughters. Spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters. And he said, rise, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. And he seemed to be joking to his sons-in-law. So his sons-in-law don't leave the city. They stay in the city and they are also destroyed. So, like, the, it's such a crazy thing that the sons-in-law think this must be a joke. Uh, which answers the second part of this question. But there are also other moments throughout our selection this week where things are also so crazy they seem like a joke. And we'll talk about them after a 10 minute break. Think about this. 
you live in a city for all your life. You get married to a woman from another place. And then one day your father in law tells you the Lord God is going to destroy your city. We have to go now. Would you believe him? Sounds kind of crazy, right? Sounds like either your father in law is crazy or he's joking. Well, it turns out in this case he's right and God does destroy the city. Um, before we look at some other examples of like God doing crazy stuff, I want to point out one last part of this. Well, I guess two parts, two parts of of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. The first part is. Before God's messengers enter Sodom. He, they tell Abraham who in this at this point in history is the guy who um, is on the best terms with God, like God sometimes will talk to him and things like that. Uh, and the messengers tell Abraham that God will destroy Sodom if they cannot find 50 innocent people within the city. And Abraham is like, uh, I know you're God. I'm just a human. You're powerful. I'm not. But can I like, can you like save the city if uh, you find only 45 innocent people? And God says, OK, fine, 45. And Abraham says, w OK, well, well, how about just 40 people? And they keep negotiating until God agrees that he will not destroy the city if he can find 10 innocent people. So like here it shows that even though God is all powerful. There is still room to negotiate with him. It's not just he gives orders and we obey. Well, as we just saw, it turns out every single man in Sodom is evil. So God decides to destroy the city and he asks Lot to take his family and escape. And he tells them when you escape. Don't look back. Right, don't look behind you and don't stop anywhere. But. Uh, let's see, where is it? The story is that here. And his wife, Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. So this is one of the this is one of the most famous parts of the story. God tells them not to look back. She looks back, turns into salt. The idea of not looking back is also seen in other classical works of literature. Uh, for example, um, if you remember in Ovid's Metamorphosis, the beginning of our selection said that it was a song sung by Orpheus, a poet named Orpheus. But actually Orpheus is most famous for the story of himself and his wife Eurydice. And the story is Orpheus loved Eurydice very much, but one day she died because of a snake bite. Again, the snake. Uh, and she goes down to Hades to hell. Orpheus is heartbroken. He no longer sings his poems. Everybody is very sad because Orpheus's singing was beautiful. And finally, Zeus is like, OK, I need to hear him sing again. So here's what I'll do. Orpheus, I will let you go down into Hades and bring back your wife. But you cannot as you are coming back from Hades, you walk in front, she will walk behind you, but you cannot turn back to look at her. 
or you will lose her forever. And so Orpheus goes down into Hades, uh, talks with Hades, god of the underworld, uh, reunites with his wife, who at that moment is still a ghost, is still a shadow. Like uh, when Od Odysseus went to Hades, that kind of ghost. So anyways, they start climbing back up uh, to the visible world. And every step, Eurydice is always behind Orpheus, but she's a ghost, so he can't hear her footsteps. He doesn't, he can't check whether she is still behind him. He has to trust. This is the wife that he loves more than anything in the world. Literally more than anything. He goes, to, he, he leaves the world to go to Hades to recover his wife. That's how much he loves her. But on this long climb back up, there is no evidence that she really is following behind him. And so just before they reach the entrance to the world, just before they leave Hades, Orpheus can't stop himself and he turns back and he sees Eurydice. And in the same moment, Eurydice is dragged back down into Hades. So it's the same idea. Don't look back. Uh, the ending of that story is that Orpheus gets so sad he kills himself. Sorry. OK, so this is one example of God doing something so crazy that you might think he's joking. There are a few other examples. See if I can find them. Um, the flood. This is uh, the story of Noah and the ark, Noya Fangzhou. The basic story is God says, humans have become so sinful, I want to start over. So he decides that he will flood the world and kill everything on land. Except for his faithful servant Noah. Noah is the one person who is still faithful and religious. So he tells Noah, uh, here, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh, flesh here means meat, roll, is come before me, for the earth is filled with outrage by them, and I am now about to destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Ark is fangzhou, cypress is bo shu. Uh, and then he describes how you should build this ark. And then, uh, as for me, I am about to bring the flood, water upon the earth, to destroy all flesh that has within it the breath of life from under the heavens. Everything on the earth shall perish. And I will set up my covenant with you. A covenant just means an agreement. So I promise you, you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and the wives of your sons with you. And from all that lives, from all flesh, two of each thing you shall bring to the ark to keep alive with you. Male and female they shall be. From the fowl of each kind, fowl means bird, so every kind of bird, and from the cattle of each kind, so every kind of uh, land mammal, and from all that crawls on the earth of each kind. So I guess this means insects. Two of each thing shall come to you to be kept alive. So again, imagine you're Noah. You're just like going about your daily life. One day God appears to you and says, I'm going to destroy the world with a huge flood. Here's what you need to do. Build this big freaking boat and I will send a male and female of every animal to join you and your family on this boat. Does that sound crazy or what? If Noah 
like imagine that you're Noah's son and like your father tells you, God just told me this, this and this. We need to do that, that and that. Would you believe him or do you think your father had gone crazy or maybe was just joking? In fact, this uh, very question was made into a movie called Evan Almighty, Wang Pai Tianshen Shuji. Uh, this is the sequel to uh, the film Bruce Almighty, Wang Pai Tianshen. Uh, in that movie, Jim Carrey plays a guy who says, I can do a better job than God. And God says, oh, really? You try it. And he gives his power to Jim Carrey, and Jim Carrey becomes God. Wang Pai Tianshen's story and of course, like Jim Carrey fucks everything up, right? Like he can't be God. Uh, so he learns the lesson to like fo follow God instead of trying to do everything yourself. In the sequel, Evan Almighty, uh, Steve Carell plays Noah. And one day, like God says to Noah, you know, build a boat, the animals will come. And uh, Steve Carell playing Noah has to convince his family to follow him and has to deal with his neighbors who don't believe him and like judging him. It's a comedy. Uh, but yeah, so this is how crazy the, the idea is. They made a whole movie about this. Uh, and then we have, um, I think we have two more examples in the selection. Right, so in the Old Test, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, everybody lived very long. Noah was 600 years old. Let's see. Um, and then here also, Abraham was 99 years old. Uh, and then God appears and says, uh, let's see, that gives him a lot of rules. Uh, and then he says, I will give your wife a son. I will bless her and I will also give you from her a son. And this is kind of crazy because his wife at the time is quite old. Right? We know that women beyond a certain age shouldn't be able to bear children. Um, but this is what God said. Uh, and then God sends his two messengers and his two messengers arrive and they also tell Sarah. Right. That you will have a son. And it says Sarah no longer had her woman's flow. So she doesn't believe them. She laughed inwardly, so she laughed to herself. And she says to herself. After being shriveled and after I'm so old, shall I have pleasure and my husband is old? Like, really, will I have a son? And God said to Abraham, why is it that Sarah laughed? Is anything beyond the Lord? Is there anything that I cannot do? In due time, I will return to you at this very season and Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah dissembled. Dissembled means she lied. Saying, I did not laugh for she was afraid. And he said, yes, you did laugh. Uh, so notice here like this is just like when Cain lied about killing Abel. But here God doesn't punish Sarah because she didn't do anything like bad, right? She didn't kill anyone. Um, so because like God says, yes, you did laugh and there's no punishment and nothing bad happens, it makes it seem like this scene is kind of like God is uh, 
like joking around and, and bantering with Sarah, which is quite interesting that God would would joke with someone. So yeah, again, um, imagine that you're Sarah, you are you are too old to bear children, and then one day two men walk in. They say we are messengers from God, and God says you will have a son. Crazy, right? Seems like they must be joking, and that's why Sarah laughs. There's one more example I want you to, uh, I want to look at with you. And actually it involves. Sarah's son, the son of Sarah and Abraham. Uh, his name is Isaac. Here. Wait, here is it. Where is it? Here it is. OK, OK, so. Um, Abraham and Isaac, this story. God tested Abraham. Uh, and the idea of this story is. Um, God one day tells Abraham, go to this place and sacrifice your son. Remember, this is Abraham's one and only son. The son that he and Sarah had in old age, their most beloved son. And God says, I want you to sacrifice him. I want you to kill him for me. And Abraham doesn't protest. He doesn't try to argue. He just follows orders. Um, and when they get to the place, they take the wood for the offering and they like he builds up where the fire will be. Um, and Isaac said to Abraham, his father, father, and he said, here I am, my son. And he said, here is the fire and the wood, but where is the sheep for the offering? It's usually an animal sacrifice. So Isaac is asking, where is the animal? And Abraham said, God will see to the sheep for the offering, my son. And then they get there. They build the thing for the fire. He puts out the wood and then he binds Isaac, his son, and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham reached out his hand and took the cleaver. A cleaver is a kind of knife you use to separate meat from bone. To slaughter his son, to kill his son. So up to this point, Abraham has not doubted God at all. Right again, this is really crazy. Imagine you're Abraham and one day God tells you, hey, you know that son that I gave you, your one and only son, the one that you love so much. I want you to kill him for me. And like Abraham doesn't even doubt. He just says, OK, and then he brings his son over to the place. But the story gets crazier. Just as Abraham is about to kill his son, the Lord's messenger called out to him from the heavens and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not reach out your hand against the lad, against your boy, and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God and you have not held back your son, your only one from me. And Abraham raised his eyes and saw, and look, a ram, Gongyo, was caught, uh, you guys were Gongyang, Sanyang, Gongyang, was caught in the thicket by its horns. And 
And so Abraham sacrifices the ram instead of his son. Can you imagine like just as he is about to kill his he has he the knife is in his hand. He has raised his hand and is about to kill his son. At the very last moment, God says, stop. I was just testing you. Don't actually do it. Let nobody say that God does not have a sense of humor. Right, one crazy thing after another. If he had not said that it was a test, we might think that God was just joking with him. So yeah, to go back to the original question. It seems like many things that God does in the Bible are so crazy that people might think he was just joking or his messenger was just joking. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense. Right? He's God. He's all powerful. He can do whatever he wants. So in order to show his power, he has to like order people to do crazy things. Right? That's part of religious faith. The testing of faith is when your God tells you to do something, would you do it? If God asked uh, Abraham to do something normal, like maybe God told Abraham, I will send you two messengers. Take care of them as your guests. That's normal. Abraham would have done that anyways, so you don't need God himself to tell Abraham. It has to be something crazy in order to have God himself uh, give instructions. And that is the only kind of test that is truly worth uh, be, being called a religious test. So that's question four. Do you have questions or ideas? OK, let's move on to question five. The book of Genesis keeps going for a long while. Uh, we don't have time to read all of it, so let's jump to the book of Exodus to IGG. So at this moment in Exodus, they have already left Egypt. The Jews have already left Egypt and are now wandering around in the desert um, because God does not yet trust that his people truly are religious enough. So he again tests them by making them wander the desert for 40 years. Um, and in this scene, Moses, their leader, and in this story, the one closest to God, uh, is called by God up the side of a mountain. And God gives him uh, the Ten Commandments. So this chapter is called Moses Receives the Law. Um, let's see. Here. So um, Moses went up the mountain. God gave him the law. Moses came back down. And now he's telling his people what God told him. And God spoke all these words saying. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slaves. Uh, so when the Jews were in Egypt, they were slaves to the Egyptians. So God has saved them from being slaves. You. And the footnote tells us that this you is the singular you. So God is not talking to all of his people. He's talking to each individual person. You shall have no other gods beside me. So I am your only God. 
You shall make you no carved likenesses and no image. That's what this means. A carved likeness is an image, basically. Uh, carving, 雕塑。所以你不能雕塑出就是什么样的画面或是形象。an image of what is in the heavens above, or what is on the earth below, or what is in the waters beneath the earth. So this law is you cannot make an image of any animal, and you shall not bow to them, and you shall not worship them. So the law is not you can't make images. The law is you can't make images and then worship them. Because I am the Lord your God. Remember, he's the one God. You can only follow him. And he calls himself a jealous God. Now, today, the word jealous in English usually means jidu, envy. Uh, you want something that you don't have, but somebody else has. But in the original meaning, jealous means protective. 要守住自己拥有的. So when God says I am a jealous God, it does not mean I want what you give the other gods. It means I don't want you to follow the other gods. You can only follow me. And then on top of this, he adds a warning. He says, I reckon the crime of fathers with sons. So like if the father create a, does a crime and then he dies, I will give punishment to the son. With the third generation and with the fourth for my foes. So those that I punish, I will punish four generations on. So not just the father, but also the son, the grandson, and the great grandson. If the father make uh, commits a sin, commits a crime, I will punish all the way to the great grandson. On the other hand, in doing kindness, uh, so for punishment, it's four generations, but for kindness, for blessings, 祝福, uh, he will go to the south the thousandth generation for my friends and those who keep my commands. So if you follow me and worship me and follow my laws, I will bless you for 1000 generations. The next one, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So in Chinese, this means uh, in vain, which means useless. So for no purpose. Uh, today, some people think that this means you should not say things like, oh my God, right? Because that's using the name of God for no reason. But really what this one means is when you swear something, when you promise something. Like today, when you go, if you're in the West and you go to court and you have to give testimony, before you begin, you have to swear that you're telling the truth. And the way that you swear in the West is you put your hand on a Bible and you swear in the name of God that you are telling the truth. So this is using the name of God for a purpose. So here, when it says to use the name of God in vain, it means when you use God's name to make a promise or a commitment, and then you break the promise or you break the commitment. Because when you break the promise, it's like you didn't plan on making the promise in the first place. So it's using God's name for no use. 就如果你用上帝之名然后承诺一件事情，啊之后又打破承诺，那等于是白白浪费了上帝之名。这个这条戒律讲的是这个，是要你遵守承诺。
uh, and then another punishment because the Lord will not acquit liang, whosoever takes his name in vain. So if you make a promise in the name of God and then you break the promise, the Lord will not forgive you. Next, remember the Sabbath, uh, the Sabbath day to hallow it. The Sabbath, an shi yu. And to hallow it, to hallow is an old word that means to make it holy. Uh, so what does this mean? God explains. Six days you shall work and you shall do your tasks. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall do no task. You and your son and your daughter, your male slave and your slave girl and your beast, which means farm animal, and your sojourner who is within your gates. So everyone, yourself, your family, your slaves, your animals, even guests in your house should do nothing on the seventh day. No work. For six days did the Lord make the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in it, and he rested on the seventh day. Uh, we saw this at the very beginning of the Bible. Therefore, did the Lord bless the Sabbath day and hallow it? So by resting on the seventh day, God made that day holy. And so we have to follow his example and not work on the seventh day. That is what the word Sabbath means, a day of rest. This, in fact, is the origin of the weekend. Uh, in the beginning, Saturday was a work day. It was a half work day. Uh, you could end work early in order to prepare for the next day um, because if you can't work on Sunday, that means you can't do farm work, but you also cannot do housework. So you can't cook, you can't clean. Uh, so you had to prepare all of that on Saturday. Uh, and the reason that today our weekend is two days, not one day, is because in the 19th century, work changed mostly from farm work to factory work. And everybody was overworked and dying and unhealthy. And so um, the workers organized together to protest the situation and they got their bosses to agree to give them another day off. So Saturday also became a day of no work. But according to the original religious idea, it is Sunday, only Sunday, that is the day of rest. Now the idea of a Sabbath, an entire day where you can do nothing, might seem today to be quite a waste, right? Today, uh, even when we're not working, we're still working, right? Your boss may give you a text message. You might have to do homework. You have to catch up on things. But the original idea of the Sabbath is not just to let you rest. It is to make you stop. Life is one thing after another until you die. If you don't choose to stop, there are many reasons for you to keep working. So God here is forcing us to rest every seven days. And in resting, uh, we can relax, talk with friends and family, count our blessings, which means like to make sure we don't take things for granted, Shifu, right? It's a day to enjoy. It's a day to actually live and not just work. So this is the idea of a Sabbath, and that's why it's a sacred day. If God created everything, 
then when we enjoy life, when we enjoy what God has created, that is something holy. 享受享用上帝为我们创造的一切，这种行为本身就是一个神圣的行为。这就是安息日是一个神圣日子的原因。Okay, next one. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long on the soil that the God uh, that the Lord your God has given you. So to honor here means to respect and obey your father and mother. Next. You shall not murder. Next, you shall not commit adultery. Next, you shall not steal. Next, you shall not bear false witness against your fellow man. Next, you shall not covet your fellow man's wife or his male slave or his slave girl, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that your fellow man has. To covet means to want to steal, to want to have uh, illegally. Uh, so it this law begins with a wife, and then a worker, and then working animals. Ox is gong uh, shui niu. And donkey is lüzi, or anything. So it begins with people and it ends with objects. Don't when when you see someone ha and they have something that you want, don't think, oh, I really want that. That's what this rule means. So these are the ten commandments. Actually, we can count them together. First one. You shall not you shall have no other gods. Second one. No images of any animals and don't worship them. This is the second one. Third one, don't use God's name in vain. Fourth one, remember the Sabbath. Fifth one, honor your father and mother. Six. Don't kill people. Seven, don't sleep with other people's uh, partners. Eight, don't steal. Nine, don't bear false witness. And ten, do not covet. So, ten commandments. The discussion question is, from the order of these commandments, xin hou shun shu, what can we say about God's priorities? What does he care about the most? And the answer is pretty obvious. First, he cares about that you have to obey him and only him. Then he says, don't worship any like images of other animals, which is sim a similar idea, right? You can only obey me. Then he says, don't waste my name. Right, don't make false promises using my name. So it's also still about worshiping and obeying and respecting God. Then he says, rest every seventh day. But the reason is because he himself rested on the seventh day. So it's still something related to God, following God. Uh, only starting on the fifth one is it less related to God. It's still related, but it's not as close. Honor your father and mother. God created all humans, so this is technically related to God, but it's not as close. Then don't kill, which is also related to humans. Don't commit adultery, which is related to humans and marriage. It's after murder because if you kill someone, they're dead. But if you commit adultery, everybody is still alive, but you have broken the promise of marriage. Then don't steal because you have broken the promise of 
uh, ownership. Then don't bear false witness. Bearing false witness is just talking, but it's breaking the promise of telling the truth. And then finally, don't uh, illegally want what someone else has. So this last one is not even about a specific action. It is merely about a way of thinking, an attitude. From this order, we can see that the priority moves from God, then to humans, then from life and death to keeping promises, telling the truth, and then finally to have the correct attitude or mindset. The very logical order. Um, but it also shows that in that time period, the law was said, uh, the power of the law comes from religion. Today, the power of the law comes from punishment, right? If you break the law, the police will arrest you and you have to go to jail. But the legitimacy of the law, 法律的正当性, 不是他的权威, 是他的正当性, comes from the government. And the legitimacy of the government comes from the people. That's why today this kind of government is called a democracy. We choose our legislators. Uh, and our legislators make the laws. That's why these are legitimate laws. But in those days, it was not a democracy. The Jewish people followed God as their one and only source of legitimacy and authority. So when God gives the law that Jewish people must follow, this law also begins with the source of legitimacy, which is God. If they don't believe in God, none of the laws will have any power. So that's why he starts with, you can only have me as your God, you cannot worship other gods, these kinds of ideas. Then he goes on to, um, first honor thy father and mother. This comes before murder. So you know that in this society, the family, the social unit of the family is more important than the individual person. Today, we usually think of murder as the worst crime because the logic of a democracy is individual rights. Right? If we each person casts one vote, therefore, um, in this kind of society, the individual is the most important. And so killing one person is the worst thing you can do. But in that society, it was not a democracy. The most important part of society is that you are a Jewish person, your parents are Jewish, and you can go all the way back to Adam and Eve. That bloodline, that is the most important part of that society. So the fifth commandment, honor thy father and mother, that is what this is about. And then the sixth commandment is don't kill people. And then it continues to property and keeping promises, things like that. Okay, questions about the Ten Commandments? Okay, we have a little time left, so I want to talk about the Christian Bible. The Hebrew Bible is the record of the history of the Jewish people and their religion. 
And part of that story is uh, that they believe if they keep their religion, if they are faithful to God, one day God will send someone and uh, redeem them from original sin. So God will send someone to end original sin and original sin will no longer be passed down and the Jewish people can finally be the holy humans that God created in the beginning. Christians believe that that person is Jesus. The word Christ means savior, so his name is not Jesus Christ. Christ is his title. Uh, and the Christian Bible is the record of the life of Jesus, the ideas that he promoted, that he taught, and then you have the actions of his disciples, Mensen Mentu, who after Jesus died, they traveled around the area to spread the word that the Savior, Christ, had already come, Jesus. And after that, you have a record of letters written by these disciples, because there are some places that are too far, they can't uh, reach in time, or they have to deal with different places at the same time. So they wrote a lot of letters, and many of those letters are also part of the Christian Bible. And then finally, at the very end of the Christian Bible, you have a book, the Book of Revelation. And this, the, the Book of Revelation is about, um, so after Jesus died, he went back to heaven and he promised his disciples that he would come back and like save everyone who believed in him. So the book of Revelation is about how Jesus will come back at the end of history. So really it's about the end of the world. Uh, and it's it's not very detailed, right? It's full of like metaphors, so it's not easy to understand. According to Christians, Jesus comes to fulfill the promise that God made to the Jewish people. God promised that he would save the Jews from original sin. And so according to Christians, the Hebrew Bible is called the Old Testament. Testament just means covenant. And because Jesus comes to fulfill that promise, the story of his life is called the New Testament. Jewish people don't believe that Jesus is the person. Christians do, only Christians do. Uh, so the new part of the Bible is called the New Testament. It is the new understanding of uh, their agreement with God. So today, if you call the Hebrew Bible the Old Testament, it's not respectful to Jewish people because Jewish people don't believe in a New Testament. They only have one testament, which is the Hebrew Bible. Now, next week, we're going to be reading selections from two of the four Gospels. Gospels in Chinese is Fu Ying. Uh, the Gospels are records of Jesus's life. In the New Testament, there are four of them. Each one is written for a different audience. And they were written in Greek because Greek was the language that most people knew in that day. In that day, uh, the Middle East had recently been conquered by ancient Rome. So Latin was the new language, but Greece was the old language. Uh, but because these were Jewish people, they also spoke a kind of Hebrew called Aramaic. Uh, so a lot of the letters are written in Aramaic. Anyways, none of it is English. We will be reading from the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. Matthew wrote his Gospel for ordinary people. Luke wrote his Gospel 
for educated people. The other two Gospels are the Gospel of Mark, which was written for non Jewish people, and the Gospel of John, which was written for religious people. Um, Mark is shortest, John is longest, and has more extra stuff. So we're only going to be reading from Matthew and Luke. So please finish the PDF file before next week. Questions? Okay, see you next week.